Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Our scripture lesson today is from Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I'm making between you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures and of every kind of the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. May God add his blessing to our reading and hearing and understanding of his word. You know, when I think of rainbows, I think of the Wizard of Oz movie and the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow. It's hard to believe that the Wizard of Oz debuted on New Year's Day in 1939. It won an Academy Award uh, for the Best Picture in 1940. The composer and the lyricist for Somewhere Over the Rainbow were Yip Harburg and Harold Arlen. Um, it, it's fascinating that uh, all these years later, in 2001, Somewhere Over the Rainbow was voted the greatest song of the 20th century by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Recording Industry Association of America. The song's appeal is universal, somewhere over the rainbow. Uh, I'm sure that you've seen The Wizard of Oz and have sung along with Somewhere Over the Rainbow. A lot of artists have uh, covered Somewhere Over the Rainbow, and you may have your favorite version of it. The lyrics uh, were written by a son of a Russian Jewish immigrant and an Orthodox Jew. And so in 1939, uh, those words would have had at least some background in all that was happening in Europe and Germany. The song is about hope. The song is about how bad times will someday be over. 
It is a feeling of hope within the song that we can relate to, and it's a hope that helped the Jewish people through the Holocaust. Viktor Frankl, uh, who was a, a prisoner in one of the camps in Germany and later wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, said this about hope. Those who have a why to live can bear almost any how. So these lyrics talk about that how. How do we live? How do we keep faith? How do we keep going? How do we maintain any sense of sanity uh, when life is going in all kinds of different directions? It's, it's a song and it's a, a theme for us today with all that's happening around us. How do we keep hope alive? How do we continue to ha have dreams and long for a better future? Someday I will reach, someday I will realize, someday I will attain and arrive. Part of the lyrics of the song are, the birds fly over the rainbow. Why then, why can't I? So the question is, what's holding us back, or what does hold us back, or, or what keeps us sometimes from finding our way? So as we get to the rainbow in the story that we've read earlier here in Genesis, it's an interesting story, um, and it's an interesting placement in the Old Testament. We started off in Eden just... A few minutes ago, uh, just we're in the ninth chapter of the book of Genesis, and now most of the world is destroyed by a flood. So Noah and his family are stepping off the ark, and God is having a conversation with Noah, and the one thing they desperately need is hope, a way forward, direction, some sort of sign. And it's interesting to note that the characters of the book of Genesis aren't just uh, characters of that book, of that story. They represent all of us. They represent all of humanity. Uh, they are all our stories, the story of our struggle with life in every generation. In every generation, we need hope. We need a way forward. We need direction. We need a sign. So Genesis is foundational to that journey, to that discovery, to that quest, uh, to that search. It outlines the conversation. It sets the markers. It tells us what to look for. It trains our eyes and ears to what's going on around us and how the world works. It gives us a map by which we can follow and navigate and find direction in life so that we can find our way to these places of hope. So in this first nine chapters of Genesis, we've, we have creation, we have banishment, we have destruction, and now we have a new creation and a new covenant. We have a shift in direction or at least a solidifying of the direction we're going to go in. We have a clear path uh, that then presents a, a plan for how we're going to achieve the goals that we have. So this conversation between God and Noah here in chapter 9 uh, is a marker. It, it's, it's, it's a critical, pivotal moment in the story. Is, is God so angry with the creation that he's just going to destroy the creation? And is that going to be the pattern of God? Is God going to continue just to, to rain wrath upon the world every time we get a little bit out of line? Or is, is, the, is God going to shift somehow to a path of redemption? So this is a critical conversation where God says, I'm going to set this covenant. I'm going to set this rainbow. And that this rainbow is a, a reminder uh, to you. Uh, and also it says to God that destruction's not the option. That redemption is the path going forward. So God chooses this path of redemption, this path of grace, this path of mercy, this path of covenant making and redemption. 
And so here at the very beginning of Genesis is this, this uh, direction is set, this uh, course is set, and so the whole rest of Genesis and the Bible is going to be how is this redemption going to take place? What's the path? What's the journey? What's the, the way forward? What's it going to look like? What will redemption look like? How will we get back to the garden uh, that we got kicked out of? How will God and humans interact and get along? This is a fascinating foundational element in the story. And if we, uh, we understand this part of the story, then the whole rest of the Bible then begins to make sense. So what's the plan? What is God's part? And then what is our part? as we go forward. So it it starts in the garden. Something happens in the garden, and the whole of the Bible is helping us to understand who we are and where it is that we are headed. So let's look at a couple of, let's go back into this first, second, third, and fourth chapter uh, and, and take a look real quick. At, at what's taking place. In, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 11, uh, Adam and Eve have eaten the apple. They've discovered that they're naked. They, uh, they're hiding and God comes to pay them a visit. And Adam and Eve say that they're hiding. When God asks, where are they? Uh, they say they're hiding because we're naked. And God asks a critical question, Genesis chapter 3 verse 11, who told you that you were naked? Who told you that? Who are you listening to? And that's a major question all the way through the Bible is, who do we listen to? Who's speaking into our ear? Who are we paying attention to? Uh, Because all around us in the world are different voices. Different voices, many of which are leading us astray, leading us in the wrong direction, taking us away from God instead of towards God, Uh, clouding and making noise around so that we can't really clearly hear the voice of God. God wants us to listen to God. God wants us to hear his voice. God wants us to spend time enough so that we know and understand. Jesus continues to ask people if you have ears to hear. Uh, Do we have ears to hear the voice of God in the world today? So one question is, who are we listening to? And that's going to be a question all the way through the Bible. The second question is, how are we finding our way in the world? How are we doing that? And that question comes from an encounter with, uh, between God and Cain. And it, it's probably the most pastoral, caring, loving uh, conversation, in, I think, in the whole Bible. And it's in Genesis chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Uh, Cain is sulking. He's gone away because Abel's uh, sacrifice has been accepted and lifted up as noteworthy, and Cain's sacrifice has not been lifted up as noteworthy. And so Cain is mad. He's gone off to sulk, and God comes to Cain, and I imagine that God sits down. They're sitting on a rock or a ledge. God puts his arm around Cain, and he says, buddy, What in the world are you doing? The the conversation says this. God says to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Why are you so blue? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Wow. God is is helping Cain understand that life's not all a bowl of cherries. Things don't always go our way. Uh, And there's temptation and struggle and battle. uh, And and we're going to have to get our head around that and and recognize that because if we don't, uh, there's evil and sin and temptation. And if we're not careful, It's going to get the best of us. It's going to ruin our lives. It's going to destroy us. And so this is just such a loving pastoral conversation that God has with Cain. As we see in the verses following, it doesn't do much good. Cain still acts out of his anger. Uh, But the question is, is right there. How are we going to get a handle 
on the temptations, struggles, battles, inner demons, uh, fears, anxiety uh, that's in our life. How are we going to cope in this life? How are we going to do that? What are the resources we're going to use? What's going to guide us in that process of choosing good or bad? And then the third question that... that uh, and, and so all through the Bible, we're going to look at how people do this, how they do it successfully and how they do it unsuccessfully, uh, manage their fear and their anxiety and their struggles and battles with sins. We're going to see good examples and bad examples, uh, and we're going to be led to how it is that God is preparing a place for us and helping us get to that place. And then the third question is, where's home? Uh, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 23, uh, Adam and Eve are, are kicked out of the garden. They're banished. They're pushed out of the garden, and, and guards are, are, are put in the garden entrance so they can't get back in. So where are they going? And that's going to be a fascinating question all the way through the Old and New Testament. Where are we going? Uh, Abraham leaves his homeland to go to this place that God prepares for him. Uh, the Israelites wander through the desert. When Jesus arrives on the scene in the New Testament, the first thing the disciples ask him is, where are you staying? Where is your home? Where, is, where are you lodging? And Jesus says, follow me. And so the New Testament, Jesus is showing them, follow me and I'll show you where your home is, where your heart is. And so all of this backdrop uh, brings us to this first Sunday in Lent. Uh, our scripture is picked out as part of the lectionary as a beginning point for this journey of Lent. Lent is an invitation to this journey to discover who we are, how we're going to manage life and, and, and manage the struggles and battles in our life. And then where are we headed? What's our direction? What's our end game? What's our goal? Where is this journey taking us? Charles West, so uh, Lent is about this walk, this journey, this examination of our lives, this reflection, this considering where are we, where do we need to be, how are we doing on the journey, how are we doing in this struggle uh, to master uh, the destructive forces and voices in our life, who are we listening to, who is guiding us, whose voice are we following. Charles Wesley in the wonderful hymn, And Can It Be?, pins these words, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? So Wesley is, is trying to help us see this journey that, that we're right in the beginning of here, the first Sunday in Lent, is, is, a, is a journey that God has set for us because of God's great love. God is wanting us to follow him, pay attention to him, listen to his voice, turn to him when we have struggles, and allow him to guide us to a place of home. You know, going back to the song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, it's said in the context of the movie or the story, The Wizard of Oz. And Dorothy is on a journey as well, isn't she? She is trying to discover who to listen to, which voices. And there are all kinds of voices from her past and in the fantasy world of Oz uh, as she gets to this new world. Who does she listen to? Who does she pay attention to? There are all kinds of voices clamoring for attention in Dorothy's ear. The how uh, of navigating through this time is, is so wonderfully illustrated and symbolized through the characters of the lion, the scarecrow, and the tin man. The lion is in search of courage that will help us on the journey. The scarecrow is searching uh, for wisdom or a brain uh, to give him guidance. And the tin man is searching for a heart. And that courage and, our, and wisdom and our heart uh, are all going to be pivotal pieces in discovering uh, 
the, the way forward, the, the next step, the, the way to live the life that God has called us to, focusing on our gifts and our blessings and the power of God in us, not on outward circumstances and not on fear. And so the story juxtaposes this, this struggle between fear uh, and the unknown with the possibilities that are right there at our fingertips. And then where is Dorothy going? At the beginning of the movie, she's trying to run away. She's trying to escape. But where really is her destination? Where is home? Where is she trying to get to? So as we journey in this period, in this time of Lent, uh, that's, the, that's the question before us. Uh, as we've lived these years of our life, whether that's 10 years, 25 years, 50 years, 75 years, 100 years of our life, how is that going? Are, are we making progress? Are we on the right path? Are we listening to God? Are we utilizing the resources that God has given us? Uh, are we taking advantage of the people and the, the wisdom, the, the, the Holy Spirit at work in our lives? And do we have a clear direction of where we're going? We all long for what God has to offer. God is calling people and has called people throughout history. Calling so that we can discover hope. And not just to discover something so that we can own it or we can treasure it or put it in a box and put it on a shelf. Uh, the discovery that God has for us is illustrated in the 12th chapter of Genesis uh, when God calls Abraham and God says to Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you can share that blessing so that you and your descendants might be a voice to the whole world to share what I've shared with you. You'll be a conduit uh, to share and to help others understand. And so this hope that God gives us is not something that we just hoard and lock away in a box and protect from uh, somebody stealing it, uh, but it's something that we share, that where we encourage others, where we tell the story, where we invite, where we encourage. When we get to the New Testament, Jesus is going to use the language of follow. And he's going to say, follow me. So it's not just God sending us or sending us on our way, but it's our following Jesus. Uh, Jesus will sort of wave at the crowd and, and talk about a commentary on the, the world at that time and say, all of these voices you're listening to, they're taking you in the wrong direction. Follow me. So he doesn't just point and say, go there. He says, follow me. And that's the promise that so wonderfully illustrated in the New Testament. That we're just not sent out to figure it out for ourselves. We have a guide. We have somebody to follow. We have somebody to look to. We have a, a way to process not that way, not the world's way, but follow me. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and everything else will suddenly make sense. And so the rainbow marks the choice that God makes to redeem and not destroy. From Genesis 9 through Revelation 22, we see this plan unfold. Pieces of the puzzle revealed, a new heaven, a new earth, the kingdom of God realized. So I don't know what a first step might look like for you this Lent, or, or what choice uh, of a part of the journey uh, that seems to make sense. Maybe the struggle with is who you're listening to and how you could zero in better on God's voice in your life. How can you limit some of the distracting voices and focus more on God's voice? Or maybe the question is, how, how, how am I doing with this struggle with fear, with anxiety, with loss, with misunderstanding? Does, do those things have a power over me? Do those things have a hold on me? 
And can I trust God in this time of Lent to let go of that, let go of the fear, let go of the struggle and the anxiety and trust God and lean into where God is leading me, listen more to God's voice. Or maybe just direction. Where God might be leading and guiding you, where home is. Maybe you've been wandering in the far country like the prodigal son for a while and God's calling you home. Home to worship in church. Home to a small group. Home to Sunday school. Home to uh, a, a more committed study of God's Word or reading some of the great literature that's available today. I pray that as we begin this season of Lent, this 40 days leading to Easter, that God will guide, direct, open a path, and that we'll be receptive to how God is calling us and leading us forward. Let us pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the foundation that's set way back in Genesis. And it's not just a story of history, but it's a story of your interaction with us and your decision to redeem and to bless and to guide and to encourage. And God, we, we ask your forgiveness for how we fall away from that from time to time and how you're ever more ready to guide and lead and forgive and redeem than we are to accept that. God, help us not to be afraid of you and your voice and your call on our lives, but to lean into that, walk into that, enjoy the journey and trust that our best interests are at your heart. Guide us this day and all through this season of Lent. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us. <music>